Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Jennifer Amell and Lance Reinsteer. Now, how are you both doing today? Doing wonderful. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks for such a uh, enthusiastic introduction. I think it's uh, probably a little bit due to the fact that we haven't gotten together, the three of us, to do one of these in a little while. So I believe uh, we all feel a little out of practice on this, but we'll get through because this is an important one that we need to talk about. But good to have the two of you back, back on the horse. Yeah, it's been a busy season for Crawl Space Media, but we want to make sure that we're keeping up with these missing persons cases and, you know, keep raising awareness uh, for these these people that remain missing. So glad to be here. Absolutely. And today we're going to talk about the disappearance of Tiffany Starks Foster from Noonan, Georgia. She's 35 years old. And this research came to us by way of Marianne Stone White, who has written some research for us before. So uh, big thanks to Marianne. Now, if you want to hear episodes of Missing ad-free and early, you can sign up for Missing Premium, now available on Apple Podcasts. If you're not an Apple user, don't worry. You can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. You get ad-free episodes, early releases, and our weekly bonus show, which a lot of people love. So check that out. And Jen had mentioned that it had been a busy time here at Crawl Space Media, and a lot of that is due to our new show, Dark Valley. We highly recommend that you go check out Dark Valley. And you also get those episodes ad-free as well in that bundle package when you subscribe. So added bonus there. You'll get the first seven episodes. There'll be a little bit of a break, and then you get the remainder of the season all ad-free, plus some extras along the way. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to cut quick to commercial here, and we'll be right back to speak about the disappearance of Tiffany Foster. So Tiffany Starks Foster was 35 years old when she went missing from Noonan, Georgia on March 1st, 2021. She's a mom of three, five, two, 220 pounds, and she's a black woman. So Tiffany had black hair and hazel eyes. Just before her disappearance, she had cut her hair short, uh, but was known to wear a wig at times. And she was last seen wearing a black bodysuit that zips up the back, possibly a Nike brand. She worked at HelloFresh as a security guard and was studying criminal justice at Georgia Military College, which... When we found out that information, I thought that was pretty impressive. She also has a heart-shaped tattoo that says Big Sister 12797 on the back of her right shoulder. And her younger sister has a matching one that says Little Sister. Tiffany also has a large red birthmark extending from her back to her left arm. And we mentioned at the top of the show that she disappeared from... Noonan, Coweta County, Georgia, which happens to be the same town where Blake Chappelle was murdered, disappeared, and a couple of months later was found murdered in 2011. This isn't related, but we just wanted to make a note of that. This town has a population of 42,000 as of the 2020 census. So while it's not a particularly small town, it's not it's not a huge town. I had the opportunity to speak to Blake's mother, you know, I think it was last year. Uh, Her name is Melissa. Blake's case is still unsolved. But I mean, knowing the ins and outs of Blake's case, uh, it's definitely, in my opinion, not related at all to Tiffany's disappearance. And Tiffany Foster is a mom of three and was living in an apartment with her fiance, Reginald Robertson, in Noonan, Georgia, when she went missing. And she was only a few months away from graduating with her degree with plans to work in law enforcement. I got to say, I always get inspired when we tell these stories of these missing people who, regardless of their gender or their race, when they're a single parent of three, she's 35 years old, and she decides like she still wants to do this. This is a point in her life where she feels like she's ready to do this. She's studying criminal justice. Like I said, I was impressed by that at Georgia Military College. A mother of three. And she was, I mean, you said a few months away from graduating with a degree. She wanted to work in law enforcement. I think that speaks to anything against her leaving uh, on her own. No matter her or any other person we talk about, when they've embarked on something like this a little later than normal in their life, they typically don't walk away from it 
a few months away from completing that goal. This is like a lifelong thing. So on March 1st, 2021, Tiffany left to go to the store and she texted her teenage daughter to ask if she needed anything. And uh, she left from their apartment at Creekside at White Oak Apartments in the 2800 block of Lakeside Way in Noonan. And that was the last text that was sent from Tiffany's phone. And Reginald later told investigators that he was growing concerned when she didn't return by 10 p.m. that evening. But he did not alert her family or the police. Yeah, so according to Tiffany's sister, Kim Bryan, Tiffany's daughter contacted her grandmother to say that her mom hadn't come home. So it wasn't Reginald that had alerted anybody. It was her daughter. And the next day, Tiffany ended up missing a class at Georgia Military College where, as we noted, she was studying criminal justice. Um, And when her family couldn't get a hold of her, they reported her missing that evening. I think this speaks to how kind of regimented Tiffany was. Like, she wouldn't miss a class, she wouldn't miss work, and that was super out of character. So her family was immediately concerned that something bad had happened. Well, almost all of her family. And people who knew her must have known, obviously, how regimented she was, given her workload and her studies that she was doing. And to not return home by 10 p.m., I wonder how long Reginald would have to have gone before thinking something was seriously wrong here. In the past, like if she had missed a time that she said she was going to be around, like would he start getting nervous after a half hour or would he start getting nervous after seven hours? Yeah, great question. And so Tiffany was driving a gray 2020 Nissan Altima, and that was something that she was proud to show off to her little sister, who was her best friend, and that's Kim, who we mentioned earlier. And Kim remembers poking fun at Tiffany, saying it was about time she got a new car, but also telling her how proud she was of her. And Tiffany's car was found one week after she disappeared. It was found on March 8th in College Park, which is a suburb southwest of Atlanta and about 30 miles from her residence in Noonan. So several of her personal belongings, including her purse, debit card, and keys, were found in the abandoned car. I think when a car is found of a missing person, you got to ask, like, why is that area important? Was it just convenient to you know, whatever had happened, like off the highway or something. Um, I do see on the map, um, we know that her phone pinged north, uh, going north around Amlajack Boulevard, and that's heading right north up I-85, which will lead to Atlanta. College Park, where her car is found, is like 30, 31 miles. It would take about 40, 45 minutes to get there. Uh, So what this makes me think is that perhaps this area was important to either Tiffany or whoever had something to do with her disappearance. Like a known area, a place that they had frequented in the past often? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, if you think about it, so say foul play is involved, uh, you know, unfortunately, in Tiffany's case, if you're going to dump a vehicle and you don't want it to be found, you're probably going to choose an area that you either know pretty well and you know it's not like a highly trafficked area um, or you're going to like, you know, hide it deep in the woods, like off the highway or something. Because it was in a suburb, it makes me think that whoever dumped the car knew that area, if that makes sense. Yeah. Essentially, like, you're either going to get rid of the car, burn it, sink it, put it in an area in the woods where it's not going to get found for a while, or you're going to leave it somewhere where, I guess you're right, yeah, you'd be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's even near someone's house that you know and trust, right? So they can keep an eye on the car. Everything's still in the car, though. Purse, debit card, keys. Yeah, her phone was never found. And it was last active at 2.58 p.m. on March 1st, the day she went missing, as you noted, uh, north of Amlajack Boulevard. So Tiffany's apartment was like about three miles southeast of this location of the last ping. Um, I did note on the map that there's an Aldi grocery store just east of I-85, which it seems to be like the closest grocery store to her home. I mean, again, this is not confirmed that this was the place that she was heading. It just seems perhaps most likely. For her phone to ping off the, uh, I guess, tower in that Amlajack Boulevard area, 
I mean, that's on the other side of the highway. I don't know what the radius of the tower is or if it was like triangulated or something. I have no idea like how specific that location is. But if it was north of the grocery store and north of her home, that means she was headed away from home, or at least her phone was. And it was three days later on March 11th that Tiffany actually missed a flight to Texas. This is a flight that she had planned. Her family insists that she was happy having gotten recently engaged. She was nearing graduation, all of these things that we had spoken about earlier, and ready to begin her new career in law enforcement. And most importantly, they maintain that she would never abandon her children. See, that's something that we haven't mentioned yet either. She's going to school, doing these things to better her professional life, but she has her children. And this is someone who, by all accounts, is not just going to take off from her children. For her not to come home, the family does worry that something nefarious probably has taken place here. And I think due to these circumstances and due to like the behavior of Tiffany before her disappearance, the investigator on the case, a guy by the name of Scott Kilgore, he told the Noonan Times Herald that these circumstances made him suspect foul play in Tiffany's case. And soon after Tiffany's disappearance, her family and fiance held a press conference pleading for information about Tiffany's whereabouts and her safe return. And here's a quick clip of Reginald Robertson at this press conference. I'm um, her fiance. Um, and if anybody do know anything, um, could you please, you know, contact this uh, office and let them know? Like I said, no matter how small or big, because um, it's, it's just unusual. She would never not go without talking to those kids, you know, even me, you know. She would not go without talking to me, you know. When was the last time, sir, that you heard from her? And and what was that about? When she left from home. She left me and her daughter at home. We haven't seen her, you know. Before we know, she was just going to go run errands and do some things. Her sister, Kim Bryan, later reported that something felt off with Robertson during the press conference. She was quoted saying, the vibe, the energy, like something in me just said, he knows more than what he's doing. And here's a quick clip of Sister Kim from CBS 46. I did not feel like he was a person that was speaking of someone that he lost. Kim goes on to describe Tiffany and Reginald's relationship. She wasn't really too thrilled about the relationship, but you know how you just want to try to make something work. You see the good in someone, especially when you're in love with them. Yeah, I trust a family's intuition for sure. Like, especially if they are familiar with uh, Reginald Robertson and know what kind of behavior he would exhibit or have perhaps seen him in other stressful situations. Like, they know if something's up. And they were right because investigators soon learned that Tiffany's fiance moved her car after she was reported missing and actually after the press conference too. And on March 30th, he was arrested and charged with theft by taking for moving Tiffany's car. And the arrest occurred after this press conference where Robertson made this plea and he was standing right next to Tiffany's family. Man, if he did have something to do with Tiffany's disappearance, like that's a lot of nerve to stand next to the family and do that. I mean, I got to say, it doesn't look good for him moving the car after a missing persons report was filed, after they're doing press about her disappearance and stuff. I wonder where the car was before he moved it. Was it at their apartment? Was it at the grocery store? Like, I have no idea. Yeah, good questions. And Robertson is now charged with kidnapping and assault, both of which occurred during a domestic incident with Tiffany back in November of 2020 before she went missing. And he is currently being held in the Coweta County Jail on no bond for the kidnapping and assault charges. But it appears he's no longer being charged with the theft by taking, although it's unknown why that was dropped. Yeah, this is an interesting uh, series of charges here. Let's dig into this kidnapping and assault. Uh, This is due to a domestic incident involving Tiffany. So we already know that there's a history of perhaps violence or abuse in this relationship and honestly like any investigator worth their salt is going to look at that uh, abusive relationship first in a missing persons case or hopefully they will yeah this is interesting so he's currently being held in county jail no bond 
on this charge, this kidnapping and assault charge or kidnapping and assault charges, correct? Yes, that's what he's being held for. Uh, But moving her car is no longer a charge for whatever reason. Right, right. So is this sort of a play by the law enforcement officials to hold him on a, I guess, related type charge in relation to Tiffany to sort of wait it out until he confesses or gives some sort of information, you think? I mean, maybe. That's what it kind of reads like to me, Lance. Um, I wonder if it's also perhaps incentive for Robertson to make a confession if they like do drop one of the charges because like all of these charges amount to different sentences that sort of thing I mean obviously if we're looking at a homicide charge here that's I mean who cares about moving moving a car (laughs) you know right and I also think it's kind of impressive that they have taken him in on something because how many times do we hear that law enforcement can't do anything because what if they arrest you know the person and and you know, the the charges don't stick and they have to release them. You know, it's just impressive to me that they found something to bring this guy in on when they probably have really good reason to believe that he had something to do with her disappearance. But they couldn't get that, right? So they go to something else. That's a good way to look at it, Lance. Um, an optimistic way to look at it. I read that as like, if they had charged him with kidnapping and assault before her disappearance, perhaps Tiffany would still be here today. Damn, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we see that all the time. You guys had Professor Liz Yardley on to talk about, I guess, some of the connections between domestic violence and homicide. It's really a wonder, like, if we can catch this behavior early, if we, I'm not saying, you know, incarceration is definitely the answer in all cases, but perhaps therapy of some sort or some kind of intervention when we know that abuse is happening before it escalates to something like this. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And Tiffany's sister and her family continue to hand out flyers and speak at news conferences and with reporters and host rallies to draw attention for Tiffany's disappearance. The case, however, has remained mostly unknown outside her home state of Georgia. And when the Gabby Petito case started to make headlines and draw national attention, Kim Bryan decided that she could no longer ignore the difference in interests between the two cases. It does make you feel, you know, well, what about us, Bryan said. When are we going to get her face out nationally? When are we going to get the FBI to come in and help us? We didn't get that. And I'm asking my mom, well, why? And it's no answers. We have a lot of questions with no answers. You know, it's just that layer that is piled on top of these disappearances that we've been talking about since since the Gabby Petito. Well, before, but I think the Gabby Petito disappearance and all of the events that happened after that really put the spotlight on the whole thing. I mean, we, we knew that there was the tendency to pay more attention to the blonde hair, blue eye, white young woman who has gone missing and her seemingly perfect boyfriend at the time while there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who are not even coming close to hitting any sort of news feed, any sort of cycle in the news. And it's hard to not get frustrated when we talk about these disappearances that don't fall into that category because there are so many of them and you don't want one of them to fall between the cracks. You don't want to lose one of them because there are so many. Yeah, I'm really glad that this issue is getting kind of a national spotlight after that, after the Gabby Petito discussion. I know a little earlier I came down kind of hard on the police department for not kind of scooping up Robertson uh, in his, you know, domestic abuse charges. But per the Noonan Times Herald, this case has received a lot of law enforcement attention. Apparently, multiple agencies have assisted in the investigation, including the Noonan, Sonoya, and LaGrange Police Departments, the Troop and Meriwether County Sheriff's Offices, the GBI, uh, U.S. Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the U.S. Marshals, um, and Department of Homeland Security. They've all weighed in on this case. So I think that's wonderful that these agencies are working together. I wonder on what level they're all working together. What is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives doing in in a disappearance like this? 
Good question. But um, apparently the uh, sheriff's office um, spoke with agencies in New York and Tennessee about human remains that have been located there. So I don't know. And around a year after her disappearance, Tiffany's father, Larry Starks, passed away at the age of 65. Tiffany's sister said the stress of it all took a toll on their father. And here's a quote from Tiffany. I do feel like my dad kind of passed away with a broken heart, per se, because, of yes, he had a lot of health issues, but to add that on top of it, I think it just made it worse. Gosh, that's always so sad uh, when family member dies before getting answers. It's got to take a really, really big toll on the family. For somebody to do this, like hypothetically speaking, if it was somebody close to Tiffany and this was, I guess, a crime of passion and this person doesn't commit a crime like this again and isn't a psychopath, right? I mean, you can commit a crime of passion and not be a psychopath, right? I think so. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So how does that feel? Because you just said how it makes you feel. And obviously, like, I feel bad. I feel terrible that a father or a mother would pass away before finding out what happened to their 35-year-old daughter. I wonder how that makes the person who committed the act feel, if they do have empathy. I mean, they must they must have this crossroads at some point where they are weighing whether or not they should turn themselves in. What's the punishment that will come down on them that will take away that guilt, I wonder? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's an interesting thought to kind of speculate what's happening in the perpetrator's mind before, you know, he's caught or charged or confesses. I I wonder, because you're right, Lance, to mention that it's not like total sociopaths who commit crimes. It's, you know, it can be anybody if given, you know the right circumstances. And I'm not saying that that, you know, gives anybody a pass for committing a violent act like potentially happened here. But yeah, there's there's got to be some heavy, heavy guilt happening in whoever's responsible's heart. Whoever's responsible has to be weighing it out, right, in, in their own head. If I confess to this and I am subsequently incarcerated rightfully and I give the information that provides answers... I'll know that the family now has this at least bit of closure where they can move on and not be wondering all the time and torturing themselves. Is that enough for me to get rid of that guilt and accept my punishment and live out the rest of my days or however however many days I'm assigned to in prison? That just must be what's going through their heads, I would hope. Yeah, I I mean, hopefully you're right, Lance. Um, I mean, not only is it the right thing to do, the moral thing to do to give this family closure. It's also incentivized uh, in the legal system. You know, you'll get a less harsh sentence if you confess and, you know, forego a trial and, uh, you know, do the right thing. But if we're talking about Reginald Robertson, who is currently in prison or in county jail without charges from assault and kidnapping that happened before Tiffany went missing. So for him, he's free on the missing person charge right now and i think if he keeps his mouth shut he is probably gonna get released at some point well yeah but that's such a short game right like he might be released now but if if and when they collect evidence uh that tiffany was murdered and her body you know discarded somewhere they're gonna come down hard on whoever's responsible i think that ship sailed when he was disposing um tiffany if if of course that's what happened but there's so many decisions he would have had to have made to do that to drive her there to put her there to hide her phone like i I just think any empathy that he may have had that pushed him towards a confession was gone several decisions before one thing i'm wondering about is kind of the timing of this i mean while it looks pretty bad for reginald to have got rid of her car after the fact. I was wondering if her kids were home at the time. I know she had texted her teenage daughter. Uh, did they live with her? Um, you know, were they in the house at the time? Did the kids see Reginald leave the house uh, at any time during that window? Did he? Uh, did they get into a fight um, outside of the house? Did he meet her somewhere? I'm just wondering about the opportunity to, to do, do something to her because... I mean, the only thing we know is that she left the house around, you know, 245-ish and then didn't return. Right. And the last 
communication of any sort was that text, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and their phone pinged not long after. And so it was apparently shut off at that point. Yeah, again, if it if it was Reginald, then he probably would have needed a ride or would have had to do something if he was moving her car, right? I don't know if he's getting a ride or taking the bus or something. Well, yeah, sure. But that was like, you know, a week or two later. That was a different no, time it was, period. It was, it was way later. It was like at the end of the month or yeah, something yeah. when the car was moved. Um, so he had that vehicle, ostensibly, maybe, uh, to get around in. What I'm wondering is, like, if if Tiffany was murdered, at what point was she murdered? How if and if it's Robertson, what opportunity t- did he have to encounter her outside the home so the kids wouldn't see anything? And how did he get there? Yeah, where was the car in the meantime? Right, I don't know. No, I understand your point. Um, I also wonder if reginald had help at some point if if he is um who is responsible i don't know how he would have been able to meet tiffany and then move her car move his car i don't know seems uh difficult to arrange i mean he would have had to have had help yeah i think because if he dumped the car 30 minutes away uh how's he gonna get back home unless there's like a bus or something i don't know doesn't this just suggest to you if something happened to her her body was put in the trunk of the car or was left with the car for a period of time and then the person went back disposed of the body and brought the car to a location where it would be found because why would you move the car if you had the car away and no one knew where the car was why are you putting it into an area where it's going to get found yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. I would hope that, you know, law enforcement did some kind of forensic processing of the car. And maybe they did. Maybe they did find some, you know, evidence of Tiffany's remains being in that car or evidence of foul play or something. But I imagine if they did find it, they probably wouldn't release that information if charges are pending. Right. They're waiting to uh, to file the charges if that is true. So that would be uh, great if that is the case. I wonder if him being in jail is a way for him to just be in one spot while they did their work and no risk of him fleeing or potentially destroying any evidence. And the clock isn't ticking on a murder charge at this point. Yeah, but I guess they don't know for sure. Like Tiffany could still be out there somewhere and in danger, maybe. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And so earlier this year, on the two-year anniversary of Tiffany's disappearance, her sister continued to express frustration with the lack of answers. And here is Kim again from Fox 5 Atlanta. It's still just surreal to us. I know for myself, um, I don't want to have another anniversary like, you know, like this. I don't, I don't want to keep having these anniversaries. I wish that we could find her. And Tiffany has been featured on the cover of People magazine, along with seven other missing mothers from around the U.S. And we mentioned a little while ago that if Reginald is behind Tiffany's disappearance, it's possible that he had help. Well, there is a reward that's available. Up to $60,000, respectively, is available. And the Bryuna Harps Community and Educational Foundation put forth a reward of $25,000 for the arrest and conviction of any person or persons responsible for Tiffany's disappearance or $50,000 for her safe return. So that's $25,000 for any conviction. They doubled it to $50,000 for her safe return. The rewards have since been increased to $35,000 for the conviction and $60,000 for the safe return. There's also a public Facebook group um, for updates in Tiffany's case. It's called Searching for Tiffany Foster. Additionally, Tiffany's case is uploaded into the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System. Her number is 80677. And anyone with information should contact Investigator Scott Kilgore at the Coweta County Sheriff's Office at 770-253-1502 or S. Kilgore at Coweta, that's C O W E T A dot G A dot U S, or investigator Toby Nix at T Nix and I X at Coweta dot G A dot U S. Foster's case number is 210 300 085. 
Our wishes for Tiffany's family is that, you know, she's found safely, but if that's not possible, uh, we want you to get justice.